I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral and traditional territories of the of our Coast Salish relatives. Uh, we raise our hands for um, allowing them to um, having us live, work, and play in their traditional territories. We really thank them as um, we are not um, originally from these lands and to being able to um, uh, be here is a huge honor and you know we definitely send out our our love and our prayers to all of our Coast Salish relatives. So welcome to episode two. This one's El Maya Tail Feathers and once again three years ago so time really does fly. My very first interaction with her was quite the story so funny thing enough at the time I was working for Loretta and at the time Maya was just filming her feature film and the only time they could meet me that day was fairly late I think it was like seven or eight and we were just wrapping things up in Loretta's in Loretta's episode in her web series and I remember telling them that I'm on my way and when I looked at the GPS it was like a 30 minute walk and I genuinely didn't want to make them wait that long so I started running I was booking it I was trying to run as fast as I could and it just seems that fate or or creator universe whatever you want to believe in just stepped in and said I got you fam and a taxi just drove by me and I was running I was running like <laughs> taxi so I was and the taxi stopped I was like can you meet me drive me over here and yeah so when I arrived at that interview I was so winded and I was so exhausted I was trying to answer the questions but I was I didn't want to make them wait too long so that yeah that, that was that was my first memory of Maya <laughs> oh. yeah and I, I've um, you know actually with with all three of our, our guests I've uh, met them through um, my my dad and my Noel and um, through you know their experiences with um, you know working with um, you know a, indigenous filmmakers with with art and, and with dance and so that's how you know I, I feel like I you know since I was like very young I knew all, all three of our our guests and um I remember one of the one of the first um, indigenous, uh, you know, once I started like learning more about indigenous film, um, the one short I remember watching was uh, Red Girls Reasoning, and which is like it's a it's a visceral it's a visceral experience. Oh yeah, yeah, and I remember watching that when I was. You know, when I was a teenager, and I was like, "Wow, it's so cool!" It's like a, you know, she's like a, you know, a indigenous, you know, vigilante, and you know, going out and, you know, taking on those, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, basically predators, and um, and so it's it's amazing, amazing short. I definitely you know, go and check it out. Uh, that was that was my first ever. Um, you know, piece of uh, piece of film that I watched from from Elamaya, and um, you know, since then, like going into um, when we went to the Indigenous uh, Digital Film Program, you know, learning learning more about you know multiple different nations, and and um, you know, we watched a little bit more of, of her films in that as well, and, and studying them, and to being able to you know just have a conversation with her was was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really amazing. She's an amazing, amazing speaker, and um, definitely like, um, like, you know, just has so much knowledge, and, and you can just tell, like, you know, with with all of what she says with her with her storytelling is just so um, in depth and so, uh, um, you know, just 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 all around like just amazing, and 
um, yeah, I just I absolutely enjoyed enjoyed having this conversation with her. Yeah, no, I, she's a visionary. She's an up and she's up and coming. She's rising, and I genuinely feel fortunate and privileged to to know her. And I, having her as our guest, I could not be any happier having anyone else from her and Doreen and Loretta. There, of course, there's more, and there will be more. And that is a promise and that is a guarantee. So, but just in general, that I am grateful that the get that our guests did agree to our humble, humble little itty bitty podcast. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. And then you know, for this goes for for you know all of our guests. Just to, we really thank you for for taking time out of your day for. You know being a part of this being a part of this project and being you know helping out and, and, and supporting this in in any way possible and that's you know definitely definitely thank you for that yeah and one minor minor shameless plug um at the time right now of uh, her documentary key on oh shoot i'm so sorry my her documentary, Kiyom Piyopitsin, um, is out right now. So if you have the time, go watch it. We need to watch it. So, yeah. So, once again, thank you for tuning in. And the episode is going to start now. Cue in special effects. Maya, welcome. We love to have you. We're glad you're here. So, yeah. Um, because you're of two different nations, does that ever influence your work? Um, yeah, it, it, thanks for having me. It's it's a real honor to be here. Um, I I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name's Elamaya Abinaskim Tail Feathers. Um, I come from Ghana or Kainai, which is uh, part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. It's also known as the Blood Reserve. Um, and it's located in what is now known as Southern Alberta. Um, I'm also Sami from, from Northern Norway. Um, my father lives over in his home village in Unyarka, and my mother lives at home um, on the reserve. And I currently reside in the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, otherwise known as the city of Vancouver. Um, and yeah, you're going back to your question, which was about being from two different two different nations and how that influences my my work. Um, yeah, I would certainly say that uh, that both of those cultures and communities um, impact the way that I tell stories, especially if you know if a film is set in either of those places. Um, so in my most recent documentary, uh, which is called Gimabi Bitsen, the meaning of empathy, um, it it all takes place in my my Blackfoot community. It's a portrait of my community's response to the opioid crisis. Um, and that film is absolutely influenced by Blackfoot knowledge and teachings and Blackfoot ways of being and um, was completely shaped by the, the people and community that I know and love. Oh, that's amazing. It's amazing, really. Hope to... Uh to check that out um so with your what you do on camera is um you know mixing both being behind the camera as a director but as well uh in front of the camera as a as an actress um what do you do to to balance between those two worlds Uh, well, I, I started as an actor. Um, I went to Vancouver Film School for acting like 16 years ago <laughs> when I was 19 and bright eyed and bushy tailed. Uh, I went to acting school and um, I think the reason that I took that route is because I'd always kind of been involved in the arts and I wanted to work in film and I didn't realize that working as a filmmaker was even within the possibility possibilities for, for career options for me. I figured that acting was, was the only way to access the, the film world. Um, 
And so I, I went to film school for acting and then I acted professionally in film and TV for a few years, but found myself just, just really frustrated with the industry as a, as a racialized person, as an indigenous person and as a woman. Um, I felt like there just wasn't really space for me in, in the industry and also just felt like I was consistently auditioning for roles that were being written and directed by non-Indigenous people about Indigenous people. Um, so they were just consistently replicating these like really damaging uh, stereotypes and just harmful representations of our people. Um, and so uh, my grandmother, who's a big advocate, both of my grandparents actually um, were big advocates for post-secondary education. Um, so my grandmother just kind of like kept pushing me to go back to school and study something real. <laughs> so I went to UBC and uh, studied uh, Indigenous studies with a minor in women's and gender studies. And while I was there, I was like finally able to understand why the industry is so problematic and um, and was also finally exposed to like this beautiful world of indigenous cinema that exists that I didn't know existed at the time. Like this was, uh, let's see, I think I went back to university when I was like 23. Um, yeah, so it's been like 12 years now. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't really, I hadn't really been exposed to indigenous cinema before that. Um, and when I finally saw what was out there, I was just like so mind blown and so um, inspired to, to try it myself. Um, so for one class, I was given the opportunity to, uh, to submit like a media project rather than a paper. Um, and I submitted a, uh, a really terrible short documentary that I made about representations of indigenous women in film. Like I used iMovie and shot it on a camcorder. Um, but having the opportunity to like actually have narrative agency and, and control over the situation was just like life altering. Um, and that's when I knew I wanted to, to continue trying to make films. Um, and so I've been making films for uh, 10 years now um, and have kind of, I guess, just found my way into being able to do both acting and and directing. I predominantly am more of a filmmaker. That's that's where I put most of my energy. But every now and then um, I have the opportunity to to act in something really cool like Blood Quantum. That was a lot of fun, directed by Jeff Barnaby. And um, I got to act in Night Raiders, which is Danis Goulet's um, uh, premier feature film. It's her first one and it's a really cool movie and it's coming out later this fall. Um, and then I got to act in The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, which I co-wrote and co-directed and worked with you on, Michael. Um, so yeah, all of those opportunities have been really wonderful. Uh, but again, I still think there's like a huge, uh, a lot of work left to do in the industry in regards to, um, to representation of Indigenous people and uh, non-Indigenous filmmakers are continually getting it wrong. And so... Um, I still feel like, as an actor, I still really feel frustrated with the industry. Um, I, I was thinking, actually, I came to the realization not too long ago that in 15 years of auditioning for film and TV as an actor, um, only one non-Indigenous director has cast me for an Indigenous role in 15 years, which I think says a lot about the state of the industry in terms of non-Indigenous people's ideas of who Indigenous people are. Um, in some of, in many cases, I've been, uh, when I haven't gotten cast, um, there have been people who have been cast that have like no living connection to any Indigenous community. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's big issues in terms of uh, in terms of, yeah, representations of Indigenous people in front of the camera. Obviously, Indigenous filmmakers and directors are, are going about it in the right way, but um, the power still is held largely by non-Indigenous people in the industry. That's absolutely true. Um, indigenous content is just running to try to catch up. And it's nice to see that we're slowly getting our voice and getting traction into 
into mainstream media. So yeah, there's a lot of good changes happening, which are pretty cool. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, I, I was a part of filming in the buyer members when the world broke open. It's long, long title, um, which is beautiful. Um, what was it like to have two separate countries to sponsor your work and was that difficult to manage? Yeah, um, well, there's, it, we're kind of at this like really interesting and exciting time for Indigenous cinema in Canada. Um, and it has so much to do with like all of the advocacy work and activism that's happened um, from within the Indigenous film community. So there's been people pushing for decades for change and for access to resources and pushing for equity and fair representation and all of those things. Um, and so the body remembers when the world broke open was made at a time when the telefilm indigenous stream had just started. So we were one of the first projects to benefit from that. Um, and we also benefited from another, from a few other like exciting um, streams aimed at like diversity and inclusion, like the CBC Breaking Barriers Fund, which no longer exists. I think they call it something else now. Um, but that being said, it, it still wasn't enough to, to make the, the film that we wanted to and needed to make. Um, we, we were still considered like a low budget independent feature. It was uh, around a million Canadian dollars, which sounds like a lot, but it's really nowhere near enough to, to make um, the, the kind of quality of, of, of cinema that we wanted to make. Um, and so we, we're able to access some funds from Norway because um, I'm a, of a dual citizen. So I have Canadian citizenship and Norwegian citizenship through my, my Sami side. Um, and uh, it's, it's really interesting to, to be part of that community over there because they have the, the Sami Film Institute, which is like this really amazing advocacy uh, organization that does a lot of funding as well for, for Sami film. Um, and they're, really, really active in representing um, Arctic indigenous peoples and, and building networks that way. And they've been really fundamental in like, um, kind of like the global indigenous film movement. Um, and so they've supported a lot of my films and they were actually the first ones to, to offer some funding for The Body Remembers. Um, and then we were able to access funds from the Norwegian Film Institute. They, uh, I think, I think maybe we got like, 10% of our budget from them or less <laughs> um, but but it was important for us to to try and do this co-production route um, just to be able to you know acquire all the funds that we needed in order to to make the kind of film that we wanted to make um, because what we achieve technically in that film has never ever been done in film before um, and and we wanted to, you know, make sure that we could like execute our, our vision in, in the way that we imagined. And so we needed the funds uh, to do that. And so a co-production was a really interesting way to go. Um, and so that meant that um, we had to have, you know, a number of indigenous crew or Norwegian crew members. Um, so we had a uh, wonderful sound recordist come over from Norway and we had uh, our wardrobe person come over from Norway and then we did all of our post-production in Norway um, so that was a really interesting process like we we flew over there um, to do our our sound mix and sound design and color grading um, and yeah it was fun just to be like overseas working on that kind of stuff and and to to see how they do things over there but yeah, an interesting experiment. It's challenging because there's all of these like production treaties and um, kind of like requirements you have to meet in order to, to have the funds administered properly and all of that. Oh, that's really, that's really awesome. Sounds, sounds really amazing. Um, yeah, so with your, uh, you know, you mentioned you had a project coming up in the fall time. Um, what else is next? Like what else have you been up to? What other... Um, projects you have down the line in the future. I know uh, this past year I had to put a halt on many, many productions. Um, but yeah, we're just wondering like what, what else is next for you? Thanks. Um, well, my feature length documentary um, is premiering on 
Friday, April 29th. So I think that's a Friday. Yeah, so it's premiering in less than a week. Um, it's called Gimma Bivitsin, The Meaning of Empathy. And I've been working on it for uh, five years now. And um, it's, it's a portrait of my community's response to the opioid or the drug poisoning crisis. Um, and I'm just really, really proud of my community and all of the hard work that happens there on a daily basis in terms of trying to find solutions. Um, the crisis has been ongoing for, for seven years now in the community and uh, in the last year alone, we've lost um, over 90 members of our nation to, to overdose. Um, and that's a lot, that's a lot of people. And all of, all of those people obviously had families and loved ones and hopes and dreams and their deaths were all preventable through harm reduction. Um, and so the film looks at the ways that harm reduction has worked in our community and um, and also explores kind of like the the complicated conversation and maybe conservative attitudes that exist towards harm reduction. Um, so for your listeners who don't know what harm reduction is or maybe aren't that familiar with it, um, there are two kind of general ways of treating addiction. One is like the abstinence model, which is like um, that people are kind of expected to quit drug and alcohol use, cold turkey altogether, and generally do like 12 step programs like AA and NA and the Red Road to Wellbriety. Like these are very commonly accepted ways of, of approaching addiction. But with the opioid crisis in particular, our community realized that 12 step programs and abstinence based ideas just don't work uh, in regards to people who are addicted to something like fentanyl, for instance. So people were going to the treatment centers, leaving after a few days, relapsing, using alone because of the stigma and shame associated with addiction. Um, and then they were overdosing and, and dying. Um, so we had to take radical action. And so that meant implementing harm reduction. So harm reduction is, um, it's a way of thinking that influences policies and procedures and, and treatment models for addiction. Um, and harm reduction accepts that um, drug users or alcohol users don't necessarily have to quit cold turkey. It sort of meets them where they're at and recognizes that the road to recovery is very complicated and there's no one simple way forward. Um, and so harm reduction is many things. It's like one thing is like distributing clean needles to prevent the spread of disease. Another is um, providing opioid agonist therapy or opioid replacement therapy like methadone or suboxone. Um, suboxone is what is used in our community and um, suboxone has um, has what's called uh, or what's known as naloxone in it, which is like uh, the the antidote to an uh, opioid overdose, um, and it also prevents people from experiencing the um, the mental euphoria or high that people feel when they use opioids. And so, essentially, it meets um, it provides people with the opioid that they need for their biological dependency on it. But they also, but they don't feel um, high, essentially. And so, suboxone is the idea is that people will be prescribed suboxone and take it every day, and eventually taper off until they don't need it anymore. And a lot of people in our community have um, are on suboxone or have been on suboxone and are now totally uh, clean and sober. Um, and so, it's it's worked in our community. Um, and we also uh, brought in. Uh, naloxone for for community members. So we have naloxone trainings on a very regular basis, and naloxone is what uh, reverses an opioid overdose. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of people, just community members, regular community members, who have Narcan or naloxone kits in their home or carry them around with them. Um, and we've saved a lot of lives. Um, and the reason harm reduction is so uh, contentious or, or controversial is that a lot of people, especially indigenous people, perceive it as like a form of enabling um, because you're just, they, they believe that you're just assisting drug users in their addiction. 
Um, whereas uh, I see it and a lot of people see it as a form of just taking care of people and, and offering empathy and compassion and meeting them where they're at. Um, and so the word gimma bibitsin, and it's a, it's a Blackfoot word that essentially means to give compassion, to, to give empathy, um, and to think of empathy as a survival tool, uh, a survival mechanism, and, and a way that our people have survived genocide. Um, and so my mother, who's a physician on the reserve, um, she had this empath this, this uh, epiphany while we were filming that Gimma Bibitsen or the concept of Gimma Bibitsen is very closely related to the ideas behind harm reduction and that Gimma Bibitsen um, can be used as, as our harm reduction, a way of, of treating people with drug and alcohol use with empathy and compassion rather than stigma and shame. Because as we've seen in our community and many other communities, um, shame and, and stigma kill like that that's that, that can lead to someone's life ending because they're using uh using alone um so the film is about all of those things and i'm really excited to share it with audiences and it'll be premiering at the hot docs international documentary film festival which is all online this year so people can just go to the box office and and buy tickets online and it's available throughout canada um, and it will also be playing at Doxa here in Vancouver, which I believe is also going to be Canada-wide online. Um, and there are talks of, of a drive-in screening at Doxa, which I'm really excited about. So hopefully um, that works out. I don't know how it's going to go with COVID, but yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the next big project um, that I'm ready to put into the world. <laughs> yeah, that sounds... That sounds like a great movie, you know, um, drugs is a big, big thing that does need to be more um, awareness out and such. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, so yeah, um, my tail feathers, everyone. That was, that was a great interview. Thanks, guys. And um, I really loved you in Monkey Beach, Nick. Congrats on, congrats on that. And I hope you keep acting. And um, yeah, it was an honor to be on the show, guys. And good luck with the rest of your interviews. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for for being a part of this. We really, uh, really thank you, and uh, really raise our hands up to you for for taking the time out of your day for you know helping us out um, in regards you know to um, you know uh, of you helping us helping us out. Um, we have a gift for you what <laughs> yeah this is a uh, uh canvas painting uh done by my my dad mike d'angeli what uh, yeah it's oh, i have it upside down there um, that's so cool <laughs> so it's called the uh, tail end of the story no that's so cool thank you yeah so we just wanted to uh you uh just publicly gift you for <laughs> for taking the time out of your day for that we, we really appreciate it and and I uh, hope um, that we can have a longer conversation because there's definitely a lot to talk about. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. Aw, thanks, guys. Take care. That's I'm so touched by that. Thank you. I, I'm, yeah, thank you. Really moved. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, take care. Thank you. All right, you as well. Bye. Bye-bye. For those of you who are watching, um, through the audio versions is that we actually uh, publicly uh, skyped. We publicly thanked our guests by giving them, uh, all three of them, a painting um, from Mike D'Angeli as a thank you for, um, you know, being, taking their time out of their day, uh, out of their busy schedules um, to sit with us and to uh, talk about their experiences, talking about films. So we, we thanked each of them. Uh, with a personal painting for them. So recently we, some really disturbing news did happen where 215 children were found in, in Kamloops. And the sad part is that's just scratching the surface. You know, there's unfortunately more out there. And yeah, no, the, they didn't get to go home. So and that's, Jimmy said, 
And our, our hearts go out to all those families, all those children that couldn't make it home. And just to know that, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely heavy on our hearts. Um, and for what, you know, and unfortunately what we call Canada and their, their history, and especially towards, um, with our with our indigenous people of having you know going through the 60s scoop um going through uh residential school uh, the potlatch band um continuously um you know throughout throughout you know today you know what happened at standing rock what happened what, what's what's going on with the pipelines and um that it's been a struggle with 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 our with our indigenous peoples but we're yeah. still here and we're still putting on the fight yeah so no matter no matter how how uh how hard we go that we you know we're still we're still practicing our art we're still practicing our culture we're all 21st century indigenous people fact that we're making podcasts we're making film we're making tv you know we're changing the game we're going into media and telling our stories that's a huge huge victory a huge honor and definitely um sending our honor to those who couldn't be here today yeah yeah um for those who are lost those who are forgotten you're not lost you're not forgotten or we're honoring your your sacrifice, and we're showing that we are still here. If you're here now and you watch through all the episodes, once again, truly, truly, thank you. Um, it's basically over an hour, and that is huge. That's a lot of time that you put into to our humble little podcast. So, thank you, and. Yeah. yeah definitely and, uh, definitely want to um, if you're watching um, you know through uh, through a visual platform you know I want to definitely you know, raise my hands to um, to our guests um, I want to uh, thank all of our our viewers as well in you know of, of, yeah as Mike was saying you know um, listening to listening to our podcast um, eat or exit Newsome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is doesn't make the cut. That doesn't make the cut. <laughs> and so, yeah, we were definitely we're definitely happy to be doing this. Um, huge thank you to Tell Us Story Hive um, for one accepting um, our application into doing this podcast, and as well as um, providing us with an amazing mentor, uh, Kim Wheeler. Um, for you know, giving us, uh, sharing us a bit of, of your knowledge into creating a podcast, and you know we're we're definitely honored and, and thankful to be to be having that. Yeah, man, I want to personally thank our editors. Thank you all. And where you can find us, you ask. Well, Nick, where can they find us? Where can they find us is uh, right now we are getting a Instagram, uh, doesn't make the cut. Uh, you can find our YouTube page uh, over on YouTube at doesn't make the cut. Um, you can find us as well individually. If you want to, um, you know, see where we're, where we're going in our own uh, careers as well. Uh, me uh, at Nick D'Angeli on uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all that amazing stuff. Um, I also have my uh, film production company, D'Angeli Productions, also on YouTube as well. So just so you know, you're all loved, you're valuable, and if you can, please go hug a loved one. Tell them you love them. And thank you for watching. Bye-bye.